Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up, went up the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became a dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were... Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make, the three, make you three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, Thanks be to God. The facts of this story are relatively straightforward, even if very, very strange. Jesus, Peter, James, and John go up a mountain to pray. While up there, Jesus begins to glow, and his clothes are transformed into a dazzling white. Soon after this, Moses and Elijah appear and have a short conversation with Jesus. They talk about what's going to be happening soon, how Jesus will need to go to Jerusalem and how he will die there. Peter, in a moment of seeming hero worship, offers to build the three of them shelters so that they can stay on the side of the mountain. What Peter doesn't understand, though, is that God is not pleased. In a scene very reminiscent of Moses at Mount Sinai, a cloud overtakes the mountain, and the voice of God reminds them to listen to Jesus. This is a strange story, a hard one to understand on the first reading or even the second one, but it's a central story. This is the story that sends us into the season of Lent. We are meant to learn something here, something that will stay and work within us throughout this holy season, all the way to Holy Week and to Easter. So we had best pay attention. While the story is strange, it is also part of a pattern. The disciples, including Peter, James, and John, have been following Jesus for some time now. They have seen the miracles he has performed, and yet they seem confused about who he is. They know that they ought to follow him, but they seem very unclear as to the end game. This story sets up a pattern that will be repeated again and again throughout the Gospels. Jesus will tell him, Tell them who he is, or he will show them who he is. But they cannot, or they will not, understand. One might think that Jesus appearing in a glowing, white, dazzling form would be a good sign that God was at work. And to their credit, the disciples do pick up on this. Thankfully, Peter, James, and John know their Bible stories. They know the first scripture reading story. They know that Moses, after he comes face to face with God, begins shining. What's more, when Jesus does it, he's not alone. He's with the two really big superstars of the Jewish faith. Both Elijah and Moses go up mountains and they speak with God. 
So it makes a certain amount of sense then to imagine that Jesus and Moses and Elijah are all prophets. But the disciples aren't listening. Jesus isn't just having a chat with Moses and Elijah. This isn't a conversation between three equal partners. This is a conversation between two prophets and the Son of God. And to be the Son of God, Jesus needs to go to Jerusalem. This isn't a happy business, but it is a necessary business. Jesus isn't like Moses and Elijah. He is much, much more. And I'm sure Peter would have been fine with more. As long as more meant politically more. Maybe he could overturn Rome. Kick out the upper echelons of power. But death? Death by crucifixion? Peter and James and John aren't listening. They don't understand. They repeat the pattern. Jesus is telling them who he is, and they are not listening. To be fair, though, it's not a bad guess. Peter offers to build the three men shelter on the side of the mountain. Moses, as he traveled through the wilderness, also had a shelter in which he met God face to face. So it makes a certain amount of sense that Jesus might want one of these too. But what Peter fails to understand is that Jesus isn't meant to stay on the side of the mountain. I understand the impulse. I understand the impulse to want to keep Jesus on the side of the mountain. In some ways, Jesus is a lot easier to take if we keep him up on the mountain. He's a wise leader. He performs some miracles, offers some great moral counsel. This Jesus is, for many of us, much more comfortable. People who would never be caught dead professing a Christian faith can easily sign up with Jesus, the good and moral teacher. We know what to do with Jesus on the side of the mountain. We can put his inspirational quotes on our walls. It's a lot harder to wrap your mind around the Jesus who goes to Jerusalem. It's harder to imagine the death of God and the resurrection to a new life. You can try to domesticate the wildness, the outrageousness of God who dies and comes back to life. You can call Jesus a wise teacher, a great and moral man. All of that is true. And all of it is a way of diminishing the outrageousness of Christ. And so the clouds pour in, and a voice from heaven cries out, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. God is literally crying, Listen to me. Believe me. I used to think that the disciples were a little bit stupid, or maybe just a little bit dense. As I've gotten older, though, I've begun to wonder if their disbelief isn't rooted in something a little bit deeper, a little bit truer. Jesus is talking about his own death. He's asking them to believe that by going to Jerusalem, by allowing human evil to kill and to destroy, that God will actually win. He's asking them to believe that by dying, he will not only redeem himself, but all of humanity. Maybe the disciples are not so much being willfully ignorant as they are desperately incapable of processing what he is saying. Jesus is asking them and asking us to believe that the power of God can overcome human evil and death. He is asking them to believe. 
despite the entire burden of history, which really proves quite the opposite. God is asking them and asking us to ignore everything else we know about every other aspect of our lives, every other minute of our lives. We are asked to place our hope in this most ridiculous idea that in dying, we might rise, that in giving up our lives, we might gain them, that in taking the road to Jerusalem, the people of God might be saved. I heard a report on the radio a few days ago about Syrian refugees trying to make landfall trying to cross to Greek islands on tiny rafts across the ocean. The interviewer started by talking about infants dying of hypothermia even after they make landfall because babies are nearly impossible to warm after they get so cold. She talked about seeing boats overturning and children and adults dying within sight of safety, bodies washing up on the shore, in the face of that, can we believe that life overcomes death? This last week, I signed a letter that was presented to the Kalamazoo City Commission asking that the city of Kalamazoo become a welcoming city, a place where all foreign-born and native-born Americans can live and work and play together. A group of clergy signed this letter saying that it is our Christian faith that calls us to remember that we too have been foreigners. We have been called outsiders and threats to national security. And we too, as Christians, have been given welcome and have been given shelter. When the conversation of becoming a sanctuary city to immigrants comes up, inevitably questions of security come up with it. Can we afford to make ourselves vulnerable in this way? What if some of them are terrorists? What if some of them aren't here legally? What if they bring crime and poverty? What if we lose something by extending them some of the good that we have? All of those are real questions and they strike at the heart, strike at our hearts and pick at our sense of justice and our sense of fairness. Those questions are also another way of asking, can we really and truly believe that God works to overcome sin and death? Can we really trust, not in some hypothetical faithful way, but with our actual bodies and with our actual lives, that going to Jerusalem is a good idea. Maybe those disciples weren't just thick. Maybe they were really struggling to come to terms with what God has been calling us all to believe for the last 2,000 years, can we believe that death is not the end? That the devastation of human sin and evil and war and dead bodies washing up on beaches is not the end of the story? It would be easier, it would be so much easier to just stick with the Jesus on the side of the mountain, the one who says wonderful things but we need to walk. We need to walk to Jerusalem. We need to take on the cross. Salvation isn't found on the mountain. Salvation is found in the cities and in the streets where the real pain and the hurting lives. And so friends, we take on the season of Lent. This Wednesday, we will mark our heads with the sign of ashes. We will remember that our lives are dust. And in our living, we are called to our dying. The question that we must struggle with, the question that we must answer, is the same one we've been trying to answer for the last 2,000 years. Do we trust 
that from the dust, the most amazing of miracles is capable of rising. Amen.